You know, we, uh, we have an amazing special guest that's with us uh, in, in Dr. Scott Martin. He is an amazing missionary church planter, someone who planted Chi Alpha on the University of Arizona. He and his family actually went in Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan and planted Chi Alphas there and with leading ministry teams and are now the national Chi Alpha directors for all the Chi Alphas, which are, are ministries that happen on all the college campuses across the nation, internationally as well. Can we please have a warm welcome for for Dr. Scott Martin as he comes to share with us today. Oh, Jay, thank you so much. Hey, I am so happy to be here with you this morning. My goodness, I haven't been here in 20 months. And so what a great, great pleasure to be back with you. And I just want to say good morning, you mighty men and women of God of Cornerstone Christian Center. All right, we got to better try that one again. All right, we better try that one again. Hey, good morning, you mighty men and women of God of Cornerstone Christian Center. There we go, man. That's who you are. You're the mighty men and women of God. And, and you know, I, I'm always tempted to share my testimony, my story, but you guys have heard it probably 15 times. So I said, I, I, won't, I won't say it again today, but I will say this. Every one of you here were created with a purpose and with a destiny in God. Every one of you, circumstance cannot hinder God's purposes and destiny for God. It's just a matter of us of saying, God, I'm giving you all of me to work with, aligning myself. So as we get started here this morning, I want to remind us, man, you're people of purpose, you're people of destiny. God has a plan and something good for every one of your lives here. And as we submit to him, submit to his call, God begins to see those things come together. So so good. I'd be remiss if I didn't start off by saying thank you. Now, I've been a missionary with the Son of God for 35 years. And I've had the privilege to minister on the most strategic mission field of the world. And where is that? The secular university, man, the most strategic mission field in the world. I'm not saying it's the most important, but I am saying it is by far the most strategic. I mean, you think with me. By the way, I say this every time I'm here. But so all you guys should be tracking with me. You name me a place where every religion, every race, every creed, every culture is represented 365 days a year. And we as the church have the opportunity to be there other than the secular universe. You think about that for a minute. Where is that place? I mean, it doesn't exist. You know, one person said Walmart once. I was like, you're close. You're close, okay? You're really, really close. You're close. You know, somebody, well, I remember one time, the, the first time somebody said Disneyland. I think, man, you go try to share Jesus at Disneyland, watch what they do to you, you know? Um, Walmart would be much more affable to that. But, hey, man, it's a powerful, powerful institution. It's a fulcrum of all societal and cultural evolution. Um, I mean, Charles Habib Malik, the former general secretary of the United Nations, said this. More potently than by any other means, if you change the university, you change the world. And so it is a powerful, powerful place to minister. So for 35 years, I ministered on that place as a missionary. And for nearly 30 plus years of that, you've been partnered with me. I mean, this church has partnered with Crystal and I in such a strategic way. And I want to say this. Honestly, I would not be standing before you today as a senior director of Chi Alpha, really globally, if it weren't for the partnership of this church, um, Pastor Rich and Cindy, and, and now Jay and Celeste. And Jay and Celeste, I just want to speak this word of affirmation over you this morning as, as we were beginning service and things are going on. Um, I just want to speak this word. You, you gave years overseas. You modeled, you exemplified, you followed Christ. You, you volunteered your time and walked in calling. But then you came back. You were turned back, really with the same volunteering and calling. And you did so really with a mandate of coming back to your own people. And I say this in the most positive of sense. When Moses, like when Moses left Egypt and he went out, and again, it, it was, there was a calling that happened. There was a purpose in all of that, even as you guys went to Egypt, and you know, even as you guys left, went to Egypt. I didn't think about that before, but going to Egypt, that God begins to form this calling and purpose. And Moses went back to his people and was an efficacious minister and powerful. And I want to affirm both of you today publicly, that there are seasons that God calls and ordains. And just the preparation, the time, 
the leadership, the spiritual prescience and Holy Spirit perspicacity that he's put on you and just the fullness of the gifts. I, I, I really see um, some dynamic spiritual things walking ahead for you and your family and for our church here as well. And I say our church as well because I feel an integral part of that. And I wanted to just publicly state that in that affirmation, just things that I had sensed in my spirit here this morning. Um, so, man, what, what a great, great privilege for us uh, to be. So I'm minister on the most strategic mission field in the world. Privilege for us to be able to gather together um, today, you know, after some of the, the COVID stuff that's happened. Um, in May 2016, something very strategic began to come forward that really will affect you as a church as well. A prophetic word began to come forward from multiple credible sources that we were about ready to witness the greatest student awakening in history. Now, if anybody knows the history of awakenings here in the United States and globally, you know that in modern age, all major significant awakenings happened, started amongst university students, every single one of them. In 1790, the first great awakening in America began to stir, went into about the 1820s. And on campuses like Hamden Sydney University, um, God began to raise up young men and women who wreck, no, I was going to use it recklessly, and I want to adjust that word, who purposefully abandoned themselves to the cause of Christ and his purposes around the world. And it was powerful as it began to alter the moral maze of the United States of America. Just pre-COVID, actually, no, it was, it was during COVID, during the COVID season, I had the privilege of going to Hamden Sydney University where we have Chi Alpha there. We planted the flag of Christ on this total historic university in Virginia, one that, that had awakening, that, that, that was influencing awakening back in the 1790s. There's been presidents of the United States who've been educated on this campus. And uh, I was there, our, our campus missionary there, contacted the president of the university, who didn't know me from anybody else, and just said, hey, the senior director of Chi Alpha is going to be on the university. Would you like to meet with him? This president responds, you know what? I would like to meet with the senior director of, of now let me tell you, it's hard to get in the president's office of a university, okay? Um, especially these secular universities. So I get this one-hour meeting. So Chris and I go in, one-hour meeting um, with Dave Simpert, Dr. David Simpert, at, um, there at Hamden Sydney University. And in there, we just start having just a, you know, I'll always shift things over to the kingdom. As I'm talking about Chi Alpha and the contribution that Chi Alpha makes to the campus ministry at large, just began to pull in a little more personal, just some kingdom stuff. And I said, you know, Dr. Simpert, Hamden Sydney was used in the 1790s, um, the students here were part of the major great awakening here in the United States. And he said, I can't believe you just mentioned this. He said, but two days ago, I was going through some of the archives here in my office, because this campus is an old campus, and I found handwritten letters talking about what was happening on campus and during this awakening. So we have this powerful time when we left. I, I just had a time of, of prophetic prayer over him, Crystal and I did. I want to say thank you. Do I know how we got there? Because you sent us there. We were your missionaries and got on hand in Sydney, meeting with the, well, the president of the university, and things begin to change for the campus, man. He wrote me a two-page letter one week later after that meeting. He said, thank you so much for coming to my office. He said, two hours after you left, I got a phone call from a mother who was just insistent to speak to me. We think about these universities. What university president you know, is really taking phone calls from a mom, you know? <laughs> but he said, for some reason after this meeting, I felt like I was supposed to take it. He said, I took the call. And he said, this mother said, Dr. Simpert, I felt compelled to get a hold of you. He said, I don't know if you know this or not. But Hamden Sydney University was used dramatically beginning the 1790s for the great awakening that happened here in the United States. Da, 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 da. And man, I got goosebumps right now. He just said, All I can tell you is that please, anytime you're in Virginia, please come and see me. Please come and see me. 
I want to say God's doing something radical and supernatural right now. We came out of COVID in Chi Alpha. I need to go, we came out of COVID in Chi Alpha. Fared better than probably any campus ministry in the world, honestly. But post-COVID, we are seeing signs of awakening. I mean, we are seeing more students come to Christ than any other time in our history. We have made a radical bounce back from pre-COVID numbers where students, and interesting, students were isolated, they were scared, they were uncertain, they were lonely. And let me tell you, when they came back in, they were ready to start talking. They didn't always want to talk about God, but we can always leave those conversations to them. So I'm saying God is doing something phenomenal right now across the United States and across the world. But I want to encourage you, the man, the Lord spoke, there's an awakening, a great awakening coming. I had the privilege of being with really a prophet of the church and Assemblies of God minister who passed away a week and a half after we were with him, he was on his deathbed. And I spent, Chris and I spent a day and a half with him. Thank you, I was able to do that because you sent us there. We're partners of ministry. Spent a day and a half there with him, just listening and, and speaking over him and him speaking over. And the last, his final words to me was, Scott, I love you. But the word just before that was this. The Lord has shown me a billion with a B, a B billion people coming to Christ in this awakening. A billion people. I pray that a million of the billion come out of the valley here. I really do. I'm praying for a million of the billion to come out of here. And let's believe God. But you know what? It's not just believing God for the awakening. It's you being a conduit of awakening. It's you being a conduit of the Holy Spirit. It's you being a conduit of awakening, of us coming up and saying, God, we're open for anything, anywhere, anytime, anything you want to do, God. We are open for that. And that is what will be the, the conduit of awakening across the valley here and filling our church here. So I want to challenge you with that this morning in Jesus' name. Well, Galatians 2.20, I kind of gave you a little introduction. Let's open up the scripture here. This is your theme scripture for your missions convention. And here's what the Apostle Paul says. I've been crucified with Christ. Was Paul crucified with Christ? I mean, really, was he crucified with Christ? Not physically. He's sharing something metaphorically so that every single person can grab it and understand what he's talking about. What was crucifixion, man? It was about, it was about death. It was about a hard Hard death. That's what crucifixion was. And so he said, hey, I'm going on the cross with Christ. I'm sacrificing myself with Christ. So we can fulfill all he went to that cross for. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. So let me ask you this. Cornerstone Christian Center. Have you truly been crucified with Christ? In that context that Paul was talking about, have we said, okay, Jesus, it's no longer about me. It's not about me. It's not about my preferences. Not about all that stuff. I'm getting on that cross with you so that it's no longer me who's living, but it's you who is living through me. That's what he's saying. So I'm asking every single one of us this morning, have you gone to that hill, that cross of Christ, and said, you put me up there too? Because it's not going to be me living. It's going to be him living through me. God's will for every single one of us in this room this morning, I don't care what your situation is. I don't care what your finances are. I don't care. God's will is that Christ is living through you. You become the conduit of the kingdom of God everywhere you go. Do you get that? Do you guys get that? You with me, huh? Okay, about half of you are. Good. <laughs> and the life I now live in the flesh, which is this, that word flesh, soma, it's our body, the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. 
So this whole passage, your whole theme passage, let me sum it up in one quick phrase. It's not about me. All right, you want to summarize Galatians 2.20? It's not about me. It's not about my will. My will be done, Lord, on earth as I wish it was in heaven too. Okay, it's not about my will. And you do realize I was saying that sarcastically, I trust. It's not my will, God, your will be done. And your will be done through me. And that I'm a conduit as I've, I've crucified myself with Christ. And it's not me who's living, but Christ is living through me. That's the will of God, that he lives through you. You are the conduit of the Spirit of God everywhere we go. So, getting there, let me ask you a question here. I'm not asking this rhetorically. I want to answer it. What's God's highest priority here on earth? Somebody tell me, what do you think? What's God's highest priority here on earth? Okay, what I heard is... Okay, there we go. Hey, I, I, spot on. Hey, what's your name? Elizabeth. Uh, Elizabeth, I think you're spot on, girl. Yeah. He wants all of us. Basically, I, I would say this. God's highest priority isn't that we get all of our stuff and that we live happily ever after. I think God's highest priority is that every person on earth has the opportunity to be reconciled with him, to have relationship with him. Because every person was created to have relationship with God, their maker. Okay. Everybody was. Every single person. So, yeah, I, I'm, I think that's God's high, highest priority. God's highest priority is that everybody has a relationship with him. So if that's God's highest priority, and you've been crucified with Christ, and you no longer live, but Christ lives through you, what should your highest priority be? Man, I got a little quieter on that one. A little bit quieter. Charlie, great job, man. You nailed it, bro. Thank you. Thank you. Because, see, Charlie just emphasizes what I'm talking about. If God's highest priority is everyone has the opportunity to be reconciled to him, then I would suggest that we, as his church, and I'm not, when I use the word church, I'm using the capital C, the people of God. I always love to say, I love it. You know, Celeste, you know, isn't it good to be in the house of God? I love to say, isn't it good to be the house of God? <laughs> isn't it good to be the house of God? That the church, the church, us have his highest priority in mind in everything that we do. And that's why missions become so important. Because this whole concept of everybody coming to know Christ in every capacity all drills down to what missions is about. It's the expansion of the kingdom of God to every person on earth. I'm going to go really quick here. Um, I'm going to scare you when I say this. That was the introduction, but now we're getting into me, and I'll go quick. Okay, that's scary. That's scary. I know. Oh, my gosh, how long is it going to go? Not that long, I promise you. Hey, Brendan, Heidi, so good to see you guys. Thank you so much um, for your commitment to Chi Alpha and for serving on a national Chi Alpha Advancement Committee. We're so grateful to you guys, and, and thank you to the church for releasing them to do so. So, making disciples, loving God, reaching the world for Jesus. Let's just start on something that is called the Great Commission. How many guys know the Great Commission? Okay, you guys, know, let, let me just quote this and actually sheet this for us. Matthew 20, 18 through 20 says this, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and behold, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Most of the time we read that, and we just skim right over it because we've heard it so many times, and we never really get the bulk of some things that I want to pull out to you this morning. Number one is this. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority. That authority is the realm of dominion, the power of God, okay? Not just here on earth. He said in heaven and on earth. The cosmos, everything in heaven, everything that exists was put under the authority of Jesus when he came here, all right? I call that kingdom authority. Kingdom authority and spiritual authority are not the same thing. Kingdom authority is the thing that, that, that speaks to the wind, and it speaks to the seas, and it ceases. That's cosmos and here on earth. Speaks to a tree, and it withers and dies. That's 
kingdom authority. All right, you get, he said, all this authority has been given unto me. And then he says, I'm giving you, now I read you the ESV version. Now I'm going to give you the ESM version, okay? He says, and because of that, go, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. All right, so here comes this radical command right there. That's why this is called the Great Commission. There's this mandate that comes forward. What is the mandate? What's the mandate? Huh? Good, good guess, good guess. Now, here's the thing. Most of the time, we think the mandate is go. But guess what? That is not the mandate. That's not the primary mandate. Because here's how it really goes interpreted. As you are going, you do what? You make disciples. The primary mandate of the verse of the Great Commission is make disciples disciples. Surprise, it's not go. Because Jesus assumed you were already going. There wasn't something, oh, yeah, I mean, you got to go. It was, it's already implied in the verse. It's assumed you are going. Do you want to know why? Who do you go, who are you going to? Who do you make disciples of? Who do you make disciples of? Who does it say? All nations. All nations. So he already assumes you're going. But the reason you are going is to make disciples. So the whole thing was making disciples. And of who? Of all nations. That word in the Greek is ethne. Of every people group. Of every tribe. And he says, and behold, I'm with you always, even until the end of the age. All right. So that's called the Great Commission. Jesus had all authority. Because of that, you and I can, can as we're going about, we go and we make disciples. By the way, what's a disciple? It's interesting. That's another. What, what is a disciple? You know, the most pragmatic term a disciple is, is a follower. Okay, it's a follower. Um, that, that's what a disciple is. It's, it's a follower. But Jesus, when he went around, most, most people who had disciples, man, hey, man, you come, you, you follow my teaching. You, you do what I say. You follow my teaching. But that wasn't Jesus' call. Jesus didn't say, come, follow my teaching, okay? That's not what he said. What did he say? Come, follow me. Jesus said, you come and follow me. The disciple of Christ was more than just following the teaching. It was about following the teacher. It was about following the rabbi. It was about following the master, Jesus, and everything we do. That's how we say, I've been crucified with Christ. If you're a true disciple, we can say, I've been crucified with with Christ. So the call, the Great Commission, was about making disciples of every nation. And that's why our missions become so important. Every single one of us have a mandate from Christ to fulfill this Great Commission. And it will be fulfilled in different ways. For some of you, it's going to be fulfilled through sacrificial giving. Notice I said sacrificial giving, not just giving. Not just giving, sacrificial giving. I think we probably get this, but we've been trying this for 2,000 years, and we've not reached the world yet. We've been trying it for 2,000 years. It's not going to happen by our own creativity. It's not going to happen by our own strategic plans. I'm telling you, it's going to be happening by the sacrifice of the church and by the people of God, and you are the church. And if we don't do something different, we keep delaying and delaying and delaying things. All right, It is... It is to sacrifice, okay? Someone giving, some of you are going to say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to volunteer um, as God has spoken to me, and I'm going to go to the nations of the world. Um, there's a lot of different ways. That we're, and some of you, in every place that you are going, you need to be making disciples, bringing them into the church, bringing them here so that they are developed and, and hear apostolic preaching, um, can understand that the, the supernatural manifestation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but you've got to bring people in. And so the Great Commission. But then Jesus had another thing happen. The, the great commandment, okay? So Jesus is out preaching. He says one of the lawyers came to him. And one of the lawyers, one of the, the doctors of the law came to him. And he asked Jesus, hey, what's the, greatest, what's the greatest commandment of all? What's the most important commandment? And Jesus says, well, how do you read it, doctor? And so here's what the doctor says. And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And after that, the doctor 
Jesus says, ah, you, you've done well. That's it. He said, you do this and you'll live. But the guy's trying to trap him. So he goes a little deeper, and, he, and this is where the Good Samaritan story comes in. He asks, so who is my neighbor? So that's how that whole thing comes out. But I want you to pick this out. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. That is the great, the great commandment. How deeply do we truly love God? How do we truly love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our strength, with all of our mind? Just how deeply do we love God? And by the way, that word love, we're talking about it again, intones that word of sacrifice. I've been crucified with Christ, but I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. So I ask us this morning, and God's mission is predicated upon these and one other thing. The last little thing I want to tie together in terms of unity, the power of unity and mission, is that Jesus gives another commandment. So there's three mandates here, guys. One, what we call the Great Commission, go in all the world and you know, make disciples of all nations. By the way, I failed to say this, teaching them to observe everything that I've commanded you, even the hard, nasty stuff that we don't like to necessarily touch on. Some of that tough stuff today, some of that stuff, that, even that stuff, he said you've got to teach everything. Okay, But then he gives one more. In John 13, 34 through 35, Jesus looking at his disciples, he says, a new commandment I give you. Okay, I'm giving you something new. New commandment. That you love one another just as I have loved you. You're also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love one for another. And so this is the third component of unity in mission and seeing God's mission fulfilled. He said the whole world will know that you're my disciples. Not because you're raising the dead. Did you know kingdom authority and spiritual authority are not the same thing? Did you know that there's been other people who've raised dead people who've not just been Christians? We, 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 you do know that, don't you? That there's other stuff that's happened. He said, they're not going to know just because you can speak in an unknown language or that you can prophesy. He said, that's not going to be the hallmark how they're going to know my disciples. He said, the way that they will know that you're my disciples is by what? The love. The love that you're showing for one another. Get this, the scripture that I read just before that was, you love the Lord your God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength. All this is predicated upon love. And let me tell you, that word for love is a very specific word. I gotta go really quicker. Three words for love in the Greek. One is the word eros, the same word we get the word um, erotic from, but that's not what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be the physical, attractional type love. So J, eros is celeste, okay? It's, it's, it's a good thing. It's a good thing, okay? It's a natural thing that God puts in you, eros. When it, when it gets out of balance and it becomes lust, then it's, it becomes a negative thing. But initially, it's, it's termed, you know, the, the love that a husband has for his wife and vice versa, all right? Second word is the word phileo. Phileo is, is the... Uh, the friendship type love, the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia, okay? Phileo is that bro type love. Hey, man, what's up? Let's go shoot some hoops. Let's go hunting. Let's go fishing. Let's go to the mall. If you're, you know, let's go spend time together, like being together. Let's watch the game. Cardinals are playing today. Let's, let's go eat something and watch the game, you know, and hope they get win number seven. Um, you know, I mean, that, that's phileo. That's phileo. And do you want to know what? But see, agape, agape is the type of love that Jesus said, and can I give you love when I'm like, I loved you. It's sacrificial. Agape love says, hey, I will do whatever it takes for you to advance in Christ. I will shed my blood for you. I am so deeply committed to you. It's not about my preferences, not about just what I want. I love you so much, I'm willing to do anything. Agape is a love that compels us to go to the nations. Agape is a love that compels us to give so that you as a church has a mission program. That's agape. That's the type of love that God said, by this, everyone's going to know that you're my disciples. It's by the way that you treat one another. It's about what you speak about one another. It's about the way you hate. They see something radically radical. It's the sacrifices that we make for one another. And here's what I've discovered. Very rarely does a Christian get to that level of love. It's a rare thing that I found in the church today. Now, I'm not around here enough to make any forms of judgment amongst you, Okay. I'm around enough. But I'm around myself enough. 
I'm around my, my nasty self enough to know I probably don't walk in enough of real authentic agape that says, man, I'll do whatever it takes, whatever it takes in my personal power to make sure that Christ's will and purposes are fulfilled in your life and the lives of everyone around the world. That This agape was the same. Jesus said, you love like I loved you. How did he love? Crucified, died on the cross, shed his blood for others. Man, people leave over. I'm mad about the stonework, Jay. I'm not coming to this church anymore. This, this should have been wood, not stone. And then we call it Agape Christian Fellowship. You think about it for a minute. You, I use that word very, very carefully. Because when you truly understand what you say and how all this ties into Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. That's the level of love that Jesus is talking about. That's the level of love that he calls you to. That's the level of love of missions, of your missions convention, all for Jesus. All, 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 everything. So let me wrap this up. Can, can you stick with me for 10 minutes? Can you stick with me for 10 minutes as I wrap this up? So the power of unity and mission. Man, there's three things that I've, I've never shared this before in a church, what I'm telling you. So I have never before shared what I'm showing you right now, ever, this is the first time okay, I've ever shared this in a church. But something that God just began to show me and reveal to me, the power of unity and mission. I want to, look, I want to just point out three things that the early church had that impeded the mission of the kingdom and warn us to make sure in a season of awakening, in a season of, of global outreach, that we do not allow any of this to encroach on us with those three mandates that were put before us. The Great Commission, the Great Commandment, and a New Commandment. Those three things. Everybody remembers what those are, right? Okay, all that in context. The first is found in Acts chapter 6. And let me give the, the background of this. So people had come. I mean, there had been an, an incredible move of God that had happened in, in the early um, first few months of the church after Jesus had ascended to heaven. I mean, Pentecost has been poured out. People are being saved, healed, delivered. There's remarkable things that are happening. So the church grows explosively. There are Pharisees coming to Christ. I mean, th there, were, there were major leading Jewish families who were coming to Christ in the season. It was a powerful, powerful time because of the power of God. That was real spiritual awakening, okay? I mean, it was, things were happening. It was being awakened. But in the midst of all this, so people... They were eating together. You know, the scripture said they had everything in common. They were sharing everything they had. But then a little problem began to happen. All right? Who was basically running the show? Well, the Jews were. I mean, the Jews, Jews were running the church. I mean, all the, the 12 apostles were all Jews. Um, you know, I mean, they, they're running. They're running things. And listen to what Acts 6.1 says. Now, in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number... A complaint by the Hellenists or the Greek population arose against the Hebrews or the Jewish one because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. Now listen, they're not suggesting, hey, we think, there's no thing. I mean, they're saying, hey, they're just flat out being neglected. Number one thing that can hinder things is prejudice. Prejudice, number one, all right? Now, I'm not just talking, Jesus said you go into all ethnic, all ethnicity, everybody. But I'm not just talking, this was an ethnic prejudice that happened early in the church. All of a sudden, the Jewish widows are getting preference over the others. I found oftentimes in church, there's prejudice. There's preferences. Man, hey, uh, man, I, I know Jay and Celeste. Let, let, let me go talk. talk. I, I know them well. You know. My kids, hey, my, my kids deserve this, and my kids deserve that. You know, uh, John and James, you know, Mama Zebedee tried to get a few little preferences for, for her kids, you know, if you remember. <laughs> I learned something in Chi Alpha as senior director, and I, I've shared this with us nationally. I've said, if Chi Alpha ever goes under, and for some reason we ever cave, it will not be from anything external. It's not going to be from the university saying, you can't be here anymore. It's not going to be from the U.S. government saying, you can't 
preach the gospel anymore. You can't do this. It's not going to be from the U.S. government mandating you have to let a Muslim be president of Kaifa. That's not going to cause us to cave. If Kaifa ever caves, it will be internal. It will be from stuff from within. It will be arguing petty little arguments that Satan tries to put in. It will be nasty stuff from within that all deals around prejudices and preferences that will cause us to crumble. And I speak this to you this morning at Cornerstone Christian Center. If you guys ever implode, it won't be because of external forces. It will be because of internal forces right here. Just as in Acts 6.1. We've got to make sure we've got to watch ourselves. We've, we've got to, and I love this. I love, and you guys are so good about this. You know, I look in here, man, there's a lot of diversity here. Man, I'm celebrating that, okay? It's, this isn't a big issue for us, but it's something I want you to have perspective of because it's what hindered the early church in mission. This hindered the early, that's why I'm telling you this. But women, your value of women in ministry and seeing Celeste and, and her speaking coming up and, and leading in worship, the value of women, the value of ethnicity, the value of diversity, that's a powerful thing. Prejudice can never be a part. And prejudice doesn't just come through ethnicity. It can come through education. It can come through, through and we may not always say this, but boy, let me tell you, I've seen classes. I've seen class systems in church before. Jesus warned about the wealthy people not getting the best seats. You remember that in James? Okay. Hey, I, I, I've, been, I've been in meetings where I've seen people want to go up and talk to the speaker who just spoke. And because they weren't of the right class, they're always in the back of the line. Let that never be a part. Prejudice is one of those things that began to afflict it. The second thing in Acts chapter 15, 1. Now, men were, I mentioned in the early church in that awakening, five minutes. Maybe seven, okay? <laughs> and the early awakening, guys, so what, what happens? It's the Jews, okay? The Pharisees, others are coming in. They're leading, they're leading the early church. Well, all of a sudden, Acts 15, 1, but some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And so what started coming in was his teaching, this rigidity of teaching that says, it's our way, you have to do it our way, exactly as we have circumscribed, not, <laughs> you get to the, the way that we have circumscribed, all right? You got to do it exactly as we tell you, otherwise you cannot be saved if you don't follow the law of Moses to dot. People who come in and try to say, Boom, this is the way we do it here at Cornerstone. Boom, this is the way we do it in some guy. This is the way we're going to do it. We've always done it this way. You have to continue to do it this way, this way. And if you don't do it this way, well then, boom. That's what was happening here. That's literally what was happening here. I mean, they were pushing these Pharisees, these people, they were pushing their influence. Man, they were going to church as people with influence. They were saying, hey, no, 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 no. This Paul joker who's telling you, you don't need to, no, 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 no. Man, you, you've got to follow all the laws of Moses. Get out the knife, buddy. I mean, you know, they're, they're really putting the law down. So this literally goes. And they came from where? They're coming from Judea, the, set, the global center of Judaism. And they're coming in the church and they start saying, you know what that's called? That's called rigidity. That's called rigidity. A church that gets so rigid in terms of things. I've seen it here in the United States church before. X, Y, Z, you have to do this, you have to do that. We believe this and only that. And there's no room outside of that. And all of a sudden, it causes division. And it impedes the mission of God. Each of these things, the whole thing of prejudice and rigidity impede the mission of God. Let me just say this about rigidity. Rigidity is a sign of death. Rigidity is a sign of death. What happens when, you know, the cow dies or the horse dies and leave it out there for a few years. Guess what? It gets rigid or a few days, a few hours, a few days. It starts stinking. But in a few hours, guess what? It starts getting stiff. It gets rigid. You can't rigidity is a sign of death. Make sure it doesn't happen here. It impedes the mission of God. Rigidity impedes the mission of God. And the last thing, Acts 5, 1 through 11. This happens early on. Okay, we know right away as the, as the awakening begins to break out in Jerusalem and starts spreading. 
that it says, and people began to sell things and share. So every, they had everything in common. They're working to follow the, the mandate, the commission, okay, the commandment, and the new commandment. All right, all of those predicated upon that one word, love, agape, all right, sacrificial love. So they, they're following this. People giving. But, man, there's this one couple in the church. And these were people of means. These were people, out, and, and that kind of got them and said, you know what? We'd like a little more attention. We'd like a little, little attention. Hey, we, we need a, uh, some attention from pastor, pastors Peter, James, and John. All right? This is basically where this is coming down. We need a little more attention. So they say, hey, we, we've got this land. Let's sell it, and then we'll go in pomp and circumstance, bring the money at the feet of, of them where we can be celebrated. Hey, we're so grateful for Ananias and Sapphira for the great sacrifice that they have made everybody. Let's just, and so it was not about being crucified with Christ and them knowing. This is about them not wanting to be crucified, them wanting to be celebrated. This wasn't about crucifixion, it was about celebration of themselves, totally giving for the wrong reasons, okay? It was selfishness. It was selfishness. It's about self and selfishness. And they went and they brought it. And so here's what the scripture, I'm just going to not read it all. But a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds. And they brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. You know the outcome of that. The Lord revealed to Peter exactly what is done. And both of them end up dead. At two different times, they both die in front of the church. I hate to say this. I wish God would still Ananias and Sapphira a few things every now and then. I really do. <laughs> you want to talk about gaining the attention? Let me tell you what, man. And the fear, and Jonah said, and the fear of God went through everyone, okay? There's a lack of fear and respect for God, his church, and his authorities today. Selfishness is one of the things that impedes the advancement of the kingdom of God. Worldwide. It impedes missions. Selfishness. I, I wrap up with this. Selfishness of time, selfishness of stuff, selfishness of finance, all those things that impede. Rigidity. Prejudice. Selfishness. None of those align with being crucified with Christ. But I can tell you, if anything's going to jack with our church today and jack with missions, those are three things that are going to do it. When we were in Kyrgyzstan, this last little story, when we were in Kyrgyzstan, and Jay, I'm not joking, I'm really stopping. When we were in Kyrgyzstan, I remember going in, and the church there, when we, in 1993, there were only, there were six million people in Kyrgyzstan, only 16 16 indigenous believers in the whole nation in Kyrgyzstan out of 6 million. That's how lost it was. Locked in part of the Soviet Union. The, the, but the Russians had been in, you know, since, since the pre-Soviet days, they'd been in there and they're trying to set their empire, the, the Russian and Soviet empire in Kyrgyzstan. And so there were some early Pentecostals who were part of that immigration into Kyrgyzstan out of Russia. But it was totally the old Soviet do you, want to, do you want to hear the Soviet birthday song? You guys want to hear how it goes? You know, ours are, happy birthday, we're all happy. Here's how it goes. Happy birthday, happy birthday. One day older, one day closer to death. <laughs> For life is just a drop from the womb to the tomb. Okay, no kidding, man. That's the song they used to sing there. Okay. So you kind of get the picture. Well, guess what? The Pentecostal church, that's kind of how the songs were. I mean, that's how it was. It was like, oh, my. Man, you get in. You're not walking out there going, praise the Lord. Let's go do something great for God. Like, God, we're going to survive the next hour. You know, I mean, it was that bad. So we come in there, and we start bringing in some new worship. And there were some old babushkas who'd, who had been there, you know, for, for 60 years. Some of them, all their lives, these babushkas have been in there, and all they're singing the old song. You're a Christian, be down. Hope you make, you know, it's that, that kind of stuff. So all of a sudden, we're going to talk about the joy of the Lord and praising Jesus and hallelujahs and all this stuff. 
We weren't singing their songs anymore. How dare, how dare we go in there and not sing their traditional Pentecostal dreadful hymns anymore? And I'll never forget one day this old babushka who'd been a part of the church. Man, she had been, she had been there from the founding, Jay. She was one of the founders of Blagaya Vest, okay? Um, joyful News, Assembly of God. She'd been a founder of that church. <laughs> oh, the irony. And she comes up. Worship is changing. The way the message, everything's changing. It's not the same anymore. This isn't how we found this. And she comes up on her cane. She looked like a Disney figure. I kid you not, man. She comes up on her cane, hunched over just like this, comes up to the pastor and me, and she says, I've been here since the beginning of this church, since the beginning of the church here in Kyrgyzstan. Now she's all this in Russian. She says, and I'm so happy because we had our day of worship in the word. And I'm so glad that you're changing it for the next generation. She wasn't selfish. She wasn't praying. It wasn't about her anymore. And she recognized, this isn't about me. If we're going to meet the needs of all these people, it can't be about me and my silly little preferences. If we're going to reach Christ and the mission, you know what I'm saying? The mission of God. It can't be about it. It's got to be about them. And man, what a model. What a model model she was. I've been crucified with Christ. Have we? Have we really? Have we been crucified with Christ? I no longer live, but Christ lives in me and through me. Is, it, is, is that true for us today? Guys, about ready to take up the faith promises. Now, this isn't my job. I just want to throw this in. Okay. Jay's going to have that. Faith, faith giving, faith promise giving. Every year, it sounds, I'm not being bold, so I'm just telling you. Every year, we've increased our giving. Yeah, man, every year I go, how in the, how, Crystal, how, we, we can't even, how can we possibly afford to do anything more? And every time, I'll tell you, I can possibly afford to do something every year. See, this whole thing's about love and sacrifice. Loving others more than myself, preferring others more than myself. It's about being crucified with Christ. I'm all in. And saying, what can I give? What can I sacrifice this year? So, I mean, this year I've said, I can fast a few meals. And I can give that money. I can give that money that normally, you know, eat at McDonald's or something. I can give that money to missions. And you know what? I can pick up a whole new missionary per month just by me fasting a couple meals. You've heard me say this before. Do you really need Starbucks? Do you really need Starbucks? Think about this for a minute. I mean, part of my mission is to take them down. Take those overpriced and take them down. Now, I know some people, no, you don't understand. It truly is a need, okay? But it's an indulgence. And if you stop and think with me just for a moment, what's an indulgence? An indulgence is something you really don't need to survive. It's that extra thing that you do to just please yourself. Selfishness is one of those things that hinder. If we could get one say, it's not about me, I'll tell you, I'm not saying give up all your Starbucks, but what if you just gave up 10 of them a month? You could pick up three missionaries with that amount of money, you know. <laughs> do, do you understand what I'm saying? Did you, what, what if instead of going to every, you get season tickets, what if instead of going to every Cardinals game, you just cut one out and you sell that ticket? You know, go on the market, don't let anybody see you. No, I'm, not a, no I'm, kid, I'm kidding. I'm joking. Don't do what I just said. Okay. But what if you did just sell, sell a ticket and give that money to missions? Man, if they go to the Super Bowl, baby, I think they'd be worth a lot of money, man. Think of what that could do. How many missionaries could we support? Do you understand my point? When I've been crucified with Christ, I know longer it's about sacrifice. So I'm saying, I want to encourage you today, when you take yourself, when you take your, your faith promise, we sit there and say, God, are, are, are we being rigid? Are we being selfish, Lord? Is, are we doing anything that would impede, impede your glory, Lord? Is there anything that would, we would do that would not be exemplary of, of your love, God? Anything. And for the sake of love, for the sake of people, for the sake of the Great Commission, I want to challenge you this year. And thank you, thank you. 
You've been so gracious to Chi Alpha. So great to Chi Alpha Worldwide. Part of our movement has begun because of you. I want to thank you, thank you, thank you. I want to challenge you. Let's make this the best year ever. Can we have a, a hand clap of honor for, for Dr. Scott, man? Wow. What a word, folks. What a word. You see it as we leave the service every single week. Those things are right there on our sign that we are to be those that love God, make disciples, reach the world. That's part of our ambition. That's our mission here as this church. And our faith promise pledge is part of that. I'm going to encourage you right now to take your phone out of your pocket as if it's not already on your lap because you've been doing other things with your phone during service. But take it out of your, out of your pocket and, and open your phone. Open up your church app. And if you would, if you just, as we're going to pray about it, I'm going to invite the worship team to come. And we're going to have this song where we're going to respond to the Lord through worship. And we're going to stand and we're going to worship. And, and what we're going to do is we're going to make this opportunity for you can make that pledge on your phone if you feel more comfortable making a pledge like this and filling out this card. At the end of our worship song, we're going to ask all of our ushers to come and help us. We have uh, some of our ladies over here that are tallying this up today and going to give us a, a number that says what our faith promise is for this year. Now, some people have already done that. They've already gone online and made that pledge. Thank you for doing so. If you'd like, you can do that right now on your phone, right where you're at. Celeste and I just did it a minute ago because we already talked about it before service today, how we're going to increase our pledge. And we made our pledge right there through the app. You can do it online as well if you'd like to do that. Or as I said, you can fill this out and turn it in. No one is going to track you down about a faith promise. This is between you and God. But what it does is enables us to have an understanding of what we can try to commit so that we can partner with more missionaries around the world. Amen? That's how we're able to, to partner with Scott and Crystal and with all the Chi Alpha ministries in this state and also with our friends across the country and with the national office and with many other ministries that happen all because of your sacrificial giving, all because of your giving to missions. Collectively, we give and we see the Lord do something. It is about that action step. It is about the go. It is about the make disciples. It's about those things, friends. But we have to be participants. Celeste and I and others, you know, I think of Laura, I think of others that are in this house that have gone themselves. They've said, Lord, I'm willing to go, but we still are those who send others. Even when we were on the mission field, we were those that sent others, supported other ministries because we believe in it that much. That though I cannot go myself, I would see it so other people can know Jesus. So let me encourage you that during this time that you would make that commitment, make that pledge. We're going to collect those after this song, but we're just going to worship together. I'm going to ask if you'd stand. <laughs> that we would be those that aren't prejudiced, that aren't rigid, that aren't selfish, but instead that we would be those united together. We reach out with the love of Jesus Christ in a sacrificial agape love for others. Amen? Let's pray, and then we're going to worship together. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much, Lord, for this opportunity, Lord, to respond to your love for us. Lord, that we can come in a response to you, Lord, and we can do so through missions giving. Lord, we can give above our tithes, our offerings here, Lord, that we give, Lord, so that others may know Jesus. And Lord, we do that sacrificially, Lord, because we have to budget, we have to do these other things and say no to things that otherwise we would want to say yes. But Lord, we do so because people knowing you is better than the thing that we get a temporary hit of dopamine for. Lord, people knowing you for eternity is better than the thing I could buy or the experience I could have. But instead, Lord, they would know Jesus because we're willing to sacrifice, because we're willing to give. And Lord, as you, we heard from Charlie today, as we heard from Scott today, and many others that have shared the testimony of how you are faithful to us. Lord, as we're obedient and giving, Lord, you open up the windows of heaven upon us. Lord, that the seed from another field will come and will be in our fields. Lord, and we'll see the bountiful harvest because we are those who are gen generous. Lord, you are generous back to us. Lord, and we give you all the glory for it. Lord, during this time, this worship song, I pray that you would speak to hearts. Lord, in faith that we would step out, Lord, and believe so that others may know you. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you for making those faith promise pledges. 
We know there are others that are not here today or they're online or other places and they're going to be making some promises as well. So we're excited to be able to get these in today. And as more of those come in, we will share with you this next week. We have a highlight this next week as well, just some mission things that are going on as we have our family, our fall family day. How many people are excited for fall family day? We are too. As, uh, as Rosie comes with that, with that total today for the first part of our faith promises, I want to encourage you, invite a friend this next week. We, get, we have all sorts of cool things happening. We have food that's happening after service next week, inflatables for the kids. We got some music that's happening outside. It's going to be a great day. Man, uh, come relax. I know a lot of you guys are dressed in the nines for Sunday, and I appreciate that. Others of you guys are already ready because you already wear shorts. I'll tell you this, if you're one that serves here and you have one of our, our city's t-shirts, wear your shirt, wear your Cornerstone shirt this next week. If you're one of those people that serve on our council stuff, man, rock your hat, do other stuff. We want to represent for Cornerstone this next week. It's going to be a great time together. We're excited to be able to share that with our community, but that we would be those awesome, that we would be those that, uh, that invite a friend and bring them along, make a space for somebody. Did you know that most people come to church because a friend invites them to come? So invite a friend, man, invite a, invite a neighbor, invite a loved one, have them come along. Even the people that don't like church, that's okay. I used to not like church too, and I had to come. I was a pastor's kid. <laughs> Guess what? Jesus gets in there somehow. You know what I'm saying? So let me encourage you, man. Invite, invite your friend to church. Encouraging today, friends, in the house. $38,360 pledge. Online, $29,640. That's a grand total of $68,000. So far, pledge to the Lord for missions. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm so encouraged. I'm so encouraged that this is the response that we have collectively. And we know that our folks that are out, that are, they're doing holiday, all sorts of stuff. The Lord be praised. We're already seeing what he wants to do on our behalf. Man, it's been a great day. Are you blessed? I am too, man. Let me pray a blessing over us before we go today. The Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Lord, I pray a blessing upon your church, your people. Lord, that you by your spirit would help us. God, that we wouldn't be those who are prejudiced or rigid or selfish, but instead, Lord, by your grace and by your prompting, that we would be those with an agape, sacrificial love. Lord, so we can show that love out to the world around us. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Know this. We love you very much, friends, here at Cornerstone. God bless you. Have a great week.